Please turn in your Bibles to Luke 9 as we kick off our spring practice on naming your stage of apprenticeship. Are you ready for this? Recommended reading. If you're new to our community, we believe that reading is right up there with following Jesus. It's not really, but we think that. Um, A few, all sorts of recommended reading. At the top of the list is Invitation to a Journey by Robert, just two to highlight, Invitation to a Journey by Robert Mulholland. It's a favorite of ours. It's kind of the best all-in-one-place book I know of on spiritual formation, and one quarter of the book is on naming your stage. And then it's not on there for some reason, but the other one is Sacred Fire by Ronald Rolheiser. It's one of my top five books of all time. I read it every single summer on vacation, and it's about discipleship in the middle years of your life, which is the longest and for many of us the most exhausting um, season of life from about 30 to retirement. So if you're anywhere in that middle window of life, this is, an act- this is a must read for you at some point, just to give you one more thing you don't have time for, and more uh, for later in the series. On that note, Luke chapter 9. Spirit of God, we just again welcome your presence, and as Gerald said, we just believe that you speak, that you have direct access to our mind and our imagination and our heart and even to our body. And so come and speak, come and do your thing. You are the pastor, you called yourself that, the good shepherd. So pastor us, Jesus. Shepherd us into your future. Amen. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, or that can be translated the way, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, you, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The Odyssey by Homer The Divine Comedy by Dante, The Pilgrim's Progress by Bunyan, The Lord of the Rings, anybody? (laughs) Hunger Games, which is just as good. (laughs) Star Wars to top them all off. All the great stories of human civilization are about the exact same thing, a journey. Professor of mythology Joseph Campbell in his seminal work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, calls it the monomyth. The hero or heroine leaves home. They face, in the language of the hymn, many dangers, toils, and stares. They hit some kind of a wall or a crisis. They either die, literally, and are reborn, or there's a descent and an ascent. Then they experience a miraculous salvation from outside of themselves, what Tolkien called a eucatastrophe, the sudden coming of good. Then they pass that salvation on and return home. It's the same story in a thousand iterations, from ancient Greek mythology and literature to George Lucas based his entire thing on this book. Because it's our story. It is the human journey. It comes as no surprise that in the Old Testament, the defining stories, the two defining stories of Israel are both about a journey, Abraham, Go to a land that I will show you and I will make you into a great nation. The Exodus, the journey from slavery in Egypt to freedom in Canaan. Then in the New Testament, Jesus and the writers of the four gospels use this language of journey as well. Jesus' refrain was, come and follow me. That implies that there is a journey of sorts that we have to go on to follow, like come, af- follow after me. There's some kind of a journey we have to go on after Jesus. 
But the more blatant language used by the gospel writers is the word hadas, which is used all through all four gospels. Here in verse 57, it's translated the road, and it does mean road or path, but it's a double entendre when used by the gospel writers because it also can be translated way, as in your way of life, or just as valid of a translation is journey. You can translate verse 57 as they were walking with Jesus on the journey. To follow Jesus on the hadas, in his way, is to go on a journey with him. Ultimately, like meta-narrative, it's our soul's journey to God and to God-likeness. That language makes us nervous in our tradition, but that's the language of the scriptures. It's translated in your English Bible as godly, but that means God-like. Our journey is to union, in the language of the Asians, with God and God-likeness, which is a journey from slavery, or what in a secular society or a therapeutic society we often call, you know, trauma or addiction or compulsion, to freedom, from wounding to wholeness, from a life based on the pleasure principle to one that is motivated by love, from false self to true, and in the end, from immaturity to maturity. The writers of the New Testament speak of this idea of maturity over and over again. Here's just a small sampling, 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Here Paul is comparing our neurobiological development to our spiritual development and saying there's a parallel there. And in context, that's in the love poem or the love chapter where the end goal is to grow and mature into love. Hebrews 5, same idea. By this time, there's a rebuke. You ought to be teachers. You need someone instead to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So much there. Peter writes this, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may, what? Grow up in your salvation. This is the problem with the evangelical view of salvation that a lot of us grew up in, where there's a moment, there's an event, and then you just wait to die. That is not the New Testament paradigm. Salvation is something you have to grow up into now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. John, in a passage that has long been used, dating all the way back to the first century, to teach the idea of this practice, writes this, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. John Stott, who before his death was lovingly called the closest thing Protestants have to a pope, said of this passage, quote, the three groups, young children, fathers, and young men, represent three different stages of spiritual pilgrimage. The little children are those newborn in Christ. The young men are more developed Christians, strong and victorious in spiritual warfare, while the fathers possess the depth and stability of ripe Christian experience. Notice his word choice, stages. What we talk about when we talk about a map for the journey of apprenticeship to Jesus is called stage theory in spiritual formation. Now, a very short autobiographical raison d'etre for this practice and how I come to it. Most of you know that, you know, five or six years ago, I had a wall in my apprenticeship to Jesus. It was essentially kind of an early midlife crisis slash emotional burnout crash. And it put me, like I was leading this large church before that, it put me demoted, it put me on a sabbatical, it put me at some real soul searching at a little bit of a younger age than I just messed myself up sooner than most people do. Um, and it put me on the spot five or six years ago. I'm on sabbatical and I began this massive reading and research project around spiritual formation that I'm still in, just really with one driving question. How is it, because I was stuck in my journey to godlikeness. Um, to godliness. 
How, how do I get unstuck? How do I and the people that are in our community, how do we grow and mature into all that God has for us? And um, that, like the Practicing the Way series that we're halfway through is all the byproduct of that, and I'm still learning so much. But as I was learning all of this life's changing ideas and practices that now are, are in the fabric of so much of our church, from very early on, a question in the back of my mind is, all right, is there, is there a map for this journey? Or at least some landmarks to navigate by? Have older, wiser followers of Jesus down through church history, we now have two millennia of tradition to appeal to for wisdom, have people ahead of us, farther down the path in the journey of Jesus, left behind anything for us, in a book, in a poem, in an idea, in a theology, in an autobiography, left behind wisdom of what to watch out for, how to navigate the path, what to expect, where to zig and not zag. And it turns out that the answer to all of the above is a resounding yes. In academic jargon, it's called stage theory, and stage theory is just an attempt to map the spiritual Journey. Think of it as cartography for spiritual formation. And stage theory is not a new idea at all. It goes all the way back to the church fathers and mothers, to John Cassian, one of the founders of monasticism in the fourth century, who said, quote, there is no arrival unless there is a plan to go. To Pilgrim's Progress in the 17th century, anybody read that? Um, I just reread it recently, it's weird. But it's an attempt, to, it's brilliant though, but it's an attempt to teach stage theory via allegory. And the goal of stage theory is very modest, and this is the goal of our practice for the next two months. It's just to name where you're at, to name your stage of apprenticeship, and, and with that, your season of life, in order to better live it. One, on the negative, to avoid the dangers of that stage or season, less like you know the hero Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, we detour to Doubting Castle via Mr. Worldly Wiseman, if you've read that, or get stuck in the slough of despond after some bad advice. And then on the positive, to meet the invitations of Jesus in every day. And that, that is the refrain. You will hear that from me so much in the weeks to come. And then as a byproduct, to appreciate where others are at to your right and to your left in the journey without judgment, which is a problem for a lot of us, for those that are, quote, behind us on the journey with Jesus, or comparison, envy, insecurity to those who are, quote, ahead of us, neither of which are remotely helpful. Bruce Demarest from Denver Seminary and his research on stage theory down through church history, it's a kind of, he has an academic paper that's an overview of two millennia now of stage theory. He writes this, spiritual journey paradigms provide the perspective that there yet remains much ground to be gained spiritually. Stage theory, moreover, provides a comprehensive frame of reference for the journey. It helps us gain clarity as to where we're presently located on the continuum of maturity in Christ, it aids heightened understanding of the contours we must yet travel on the course. It assists us not to repeat past mistakes and to avoid future pitfalls. It will likely alert us to seasons of testing, crisis, and dark nights yet to come. It will inform us of valuable resources that can enrich prayer experience, facilitate emotional and spiritual healing, and deepen transforming relationship with Christ. So we'll get into all of this. We'll get into stage theory paradigms, first half of life, second half of life, active, passive spirituality, dark night of the soul. Morris down here is teaching a whole sermon on how to age well. So get ready for that, all of you that want to age. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Now before we get into it today, a few disclaimers, and by a few, I mean five, okay? So this is just, you want nuance, here we go, all right? It's like I don't even get what this is yet. Well, here we go. Just, Five disclaimers. One, stage theory is very similar to personality theory, whether that's Enneagram or Myers-Briggs. That's why we're hosting the Enneagram conference with this practice. So in the same way that it's really helpful to hear a teaching of Jesus and filter that through, okay, how do I live that out as an introvert or an extrovert, or as an S or an N on the Myers-Briggs, or as a type four or a type seven, and to kind of know your Achilles heel, your sweet spot, it's just really helpful to know that. In a very similar way, stage theory is almost identical in that it's very helpful to hear a teaching of Jesus and think, okay, how do I live that out when I'm just brand new to this thing? Or when I'm in the second half of life? Or as a young parent with three little kids? 
or right in the middle of a midlife crisis, it's re- or in a dark night of the soul. It's really helpful to have that lens. It's very similar to have the lens of your Enneagram number, or your Myers-Briggs type, or introvert. It's the exact same kind of, it's very helpful. But that said, just like personality theory, it's a theory. It's not science, there's zero science behind the Enneagram, there's hardly any behind the Myers-Briggs. It's, there's no, there's no um, theology, there's no chapter and verse. I will not exegete to you stage theory from Ephesians chapter nine. There is no Ephesians chapter nine. It's not there. It's more biographical than biblical, but again, we have two millennia of followers of Jesus saying this is kind of what it's like. And so I would say the same thing about sage theory that I say to skeptics around personality theory. If the shoe fits, wear it. If it's helpful, great. If it's not helpful, come back in June. Secondly, um, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's, there's, some of it will be helpful, I promise, hopefully, I promise. Secondly, it's not nearly as linear as it sounds. So to teach stage there, you have to, you have to make life sound more linear than it really is. Ancient writers use the metaphor of a ladder that we climb to God. More modern writers use the um, kind of word picture of a timeline, and we ch- you chart your life on a timeline through stages. I think the best image to capture the felt experience of stage theory and really just life with Jesus is that of an upward spiral where you move up at times and then you feel like you move down, you feel like you progress, then you feel like you regress, and you kind of circle around themes in the way of Jesus, but slowly but surely you arc upward toward more and more life with God. One writer I read this week likened it to Monopoly where you go around the board again and again and hopefully each time you progress and get a few new properties but sometimes you get stuck in jail or you just circle the thing. I hate that because I detest Monopoly. It is, it is just satanic and so I prefer the upward spiral to Monopoly but you do you, all right? Um, number three, You can apply stage theory both to your life as a whole and to any area of your life. This is very important. Most of us are really far down the path to maturity in some areas, or at least semi-far down the path, and still stuck in spiritual puberty in others. If you feel that way, welcome to the human condition. That's normal. Robert Mulholland writes this. This means we can be at different stages in different areas. In one area, we may be well along the path to wholeness. While in another area, God is just beginning to awaken us, more on that in a minute, to another part of our life that needs transformation. Since God always leaves us free to reject transformation, that is a key idea. You do not have to grow into Christ-likeness. Jesus will respect your dignity with so much love. It is also possible for us to regress in this process or in old-fashioned terms to backslide. Thus, our Christian pilgrimage is a complex, multifaceted, multi-level ebb and flow of relationship with God. On that note, number four, at any point you can stop your progress, plateau, and even regress. Again, out of Jesus' love and respect for you and your human dignity. In fact, most experts on stage theory agree, and I hate this, but very few people reach the later stages. Dr. Robert Clinton in The Making of a Leader, which is stage theory applied to spiritual leadership, not leadership in general, but spiritual leadership, makes the point that in the library of scripture, of all the biographies we have, only 30% of leaders end well. There is a sobering reality to that. The math is not in your favor. It's worth our time to ponder. And finally, the journey is not quick. Just like physical growth, um, your spiritual growth is a slow, long, at times painful process. Those of you in your teenage years, you know that. Parent of a middle schooler, I know that really well right now. But unlike physical growth, we never stop. We never arrive on the spiritual journey. As St. Teresa of Avelia said in The Interior Castle, which is her book on stage theory as applied to prayer, No one becomes so advanced that they don't often have to return to the beginning. Does that sound familiar? Nobody is so far down the path of Jesus that we don't often have to come back to the basics. So the plan for the next few weeks is to lay out a few stage theory paradigms just to kind of kick off the practice, and we have a ton of content after that. Now, I want to give you more than one paradigm Because, again, there's no chapter and verse to turn to, and there's no one-size-fits-all approach to the journey with Jesus. As the saying goes, all journeys are similar, all journeys are different. 
you um, might hear one paradigm and think, oh my gosh, that fits my autobiography to a T, or you might think, ah, that doesn't really match my felt experience, and that's fine either way. To begin, the most ancient paradigm, and I start here not because I think it's necessarily the best, this is just the most ancient one, is called the three ways. It goes all the way back to second century, to Origen, runs through to Anselm, then to St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, that towering intellectual, up to Teresa and St. John of the Cross in the 16th century, and writers like Robert Mulholland and John Ortberg today. And the three ways are awakening, purgation, illumination, and union. And if you're thinking, that's four, you idiot, not three. How bad at math are you? I'm pretty bad, but not that bad. Um, Awakening is essentially a pre-stage for those who are not yet followers of Jesus. So for the rest of our time, just a short word on each to give you something to think about this week. Does that sound okay? Are we still here? We're alive? We're awake? Yes? Okay, fantastic. This will help eventually. First, or not, or almost first, awakening. In awakening, we come awake to the reality of God in a culture that is asleep. We realize there's more than the material. There's the spiritual. We awaken to two primary realities. One, the reality of God, as he actually is. There is a God, whoa, that changes everything. And two, the reality of ourselves as we actually are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, not the image we project to the world, not the mantra we believe from our culture of you do you, but the the actuality of you, of me, and all of our beauty and all of our pain. Until this happens, this awakening to God and ourself, we are spiritually sleepwalking, Or more bluntly, in the language of the Jesus tradition, we are spiritually dead. Awakening can be slow and incremental and take place over years or decades, or it can be sudden and radical and all at once in a random encounter at a coffee shop. Some of you are in this stage now. You're just coming out of Alpha or you've been coming to Sunday gatherings for a while, and you're still not sure what you think, because what you're hearing, the messaging you're hearing, not only here, but on the pages of the four Gospels and from Jesus and from the Jesus tradition, is radically at odds with the secular hedonism of our city that we love and call home. But you're coming to realize there is more to life. There's more. And we can't live without that more. We can't live without meaning and purpose. You can only live off of brunch for so long. At some point, there has to be more to the human experience. And you're coming to realize you're not just an animal with time and chance on your side. You have a soul, a mind, not just a brain. And there is a God of love. Jesus called this experience rebirth when we're born out of our mother's womb and our little world and our desires for survival and pleasure at this are the center of our reality, but when we're born again in Jesus' language, our world is expanded. It's like we open our eyes for the first time again, and now we are no longer the center. God and others and love is the center. Now, this is followed by stage one in the life of Jesus called purgation, Just a great, positive, happy name for you this morning. This is ancient language, not mine, all right? We become what the mystics called a beginner. We begin. We begin to follow Jesus. We begin to take in his teachings through the Bible and church history. We begin to practice the spiritual disciplines, to slow down, to Sabbath, to read our Bible, to pray, to come to church, to live in community. As we pray, we begin to experience the reality of a God that is all around us. And immediately, we come up against what our tradition calls sin, habits of mind and body that are dysfunctional and bent in the wrong direction and hold us back from life. As the writer of Hebrews puts it in chapter 12, it's like trying to run a race with a backpack and a ball and chain on. It just does not work. Purgation is the process of getting the sin burned out of us. It's cognate is the word purgatory. Same idea, but in this life, not the next. Purgation has its own four substages. This, the first is what the ancient called gross sins. Not gross as in ew, but gross as in major. 
This is Jesus and Paul's sinless in the New Testament, such as Paul's in Galatians 5, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and Game of Thrones. That's not in there, but it's, it's in the Greek. And gross sins are the first to go. Often you hear people that are brand new to Jesus with some crazy story like, I was just us, I'm like, shock and awe thing or whatever. And Jesus saved me and now I'm, I'm clean or I'm free or I'm in a new life or I'm in a new situation. It's beautiful, that's layer one. Layer two is conscious sins. Um, conscious sins are sins that are socially acceptable in culture at large, yet are not the way of Jesus. Things like, I mean the most common example is just sex, sexuality, where our culture is most at odds with Jesus' vision of human flourishing. There is the deepest kind of disconcordant ah between what culture thinks leads to life and what Jesus thinks leads to life. Other examples would be divorce or pornography or even violence or at least military violence. But it's also sins that are socially acceptable inside the church. Things like Game of Thrones, or whatever Netflix show is popular at time that is totally cool to watch inside the church, but yet is porn. It's a way to engender lustfulness and anger in you. Or something like materialism, which even religious fundamentalists are still totally cool with for the most part, or over shopping or gossip, which fundamentalists tend to be really good at, actually. Things that are not the way of Jesus, and yet we still, the reason it's called conscious sins, we still choose to do them. So this is not addiction, this is not like, oh, I wanna stop so bad, but I can't. This is like, this is a hard-heartedness in the language of Jesus. You just say, nah, whatever. You make a decision to do something based on your willpower, even if it's at odds with Jesus and his vision of what he called life to the full. Next layer down is unconscious sins. Mulholland writes, here is where we begin to let the Spirit of God reveal to us aspects of our inner being that have been invisible to our view, but that now we begin to see as hindrances to our growth toward wholeness in the image of Christ. They have to do not just with sins of commission, but sins of omission. Not just with what we do with our mouth or our body, but with what we don't do. Or with our motivations, where we do the right thing, but for the wrong reasons. Or with how other people experience us in interpersonal relationships. So take, for example, the sin of, say, anger. Level one, the gross sin is violence, like you get in a fight outside the pub or whatever. Or to bring it a little closer to home, domestic violence, which is far more common than most people realize, not just from men, but from women. Hitting, throwing things, using your body to slap or in an unkind way. That's level one. Level two, conscious sins is you don't do that anymore. You yell at each other though. You call each other a dirty name, you whatever. You threaten divorce or whatever it is. And then level three, unconscious sins would be you would never hit, you would never throw a cheese grater at your spouse like Tammy did to me years ago. You would never... <laughs> It's a long story, and in context, I deserved every bit of it. You want to see the scar? It's a whole other thing. But um, <laughs> that is a true story. But you would never do that. You have, like, you're a new person now, right, my love? <laughs> <laughs> you would never throw. You would never use your body for violence. You would never say you and utter some expletive. You would never threaten to walk out on your partner, but still inside, you're seething with contempt, where you think you are better than the other person, where you write off not just the behavior, but you define the person by the behavior. There's superiority in you, or there's resentment, or there's an undercurrent of bitterness, or whatever it is. This is all layer three stuff, and layer three usually takes a very long time to purge out of our system. The gross stuff is actually the first stuff to go and the easiest. This is, this, this is where so many people get stuck. And it's crucial. Because if all we ever deal with is just level one and level two, then all we ever deal with is behavior. And if all we ever deal with is our behavior, then at best we are a Pharisee. 
and we are, are bent towards self-righteousness, and Jesus seemed to have more issue with self-righteousness than he even did with lousy behavior. That's not to, to justify lousy behavior, I need to say that in this city, but that's an issue. We have to deal with this stuff. We have to get unstuck and move forward into Christ-likeness. And once you deal with this level three stuff, you're dealing with what Jung and others called your shadow side or your unconscious or whatever language you want to use from inside the Jesus tradition or the psychological tradition. But we're still not there. Four is what, again, Mulholland calls our trust structures which he defines as, quote, deep-seated attitudes and inner orientations of our being out of which our behavior patterns flow. Those deep inner postures of our being that do not rely on God, but on self for our well-being. This is what Thomas Keating called our emotional programs for happiness. The, the programs that we come up with, the ways to cope with the pain of our life and our brokenness in order to live happy. It's what our Reformed friends call idols of the heart. And the tricky thing about our trust structures or idols of the heart or whatever you want to call it is, is they usually aren't sinful behaviors at all. Often they're good things or neutral things. It's exercise or work or travel or marriage or parenting or even ministry in the church but still it's things that we look to for well-being, for our peace and our happiness that don't go by the name of Jesus. The best way to self-diagnose is to simply ask yourself the question, how would I feel if I lost this? How would I feel if I was still single in five years, in 10, if I was always single? How would I feel if my child didn't get into that school or didn't make me look good in 10 years? How would I feel if I lost my job? How would I feel if I lost my position? How would I feel if I lost my beach body or whatever it is? I never had one to lose, but I, in a hypothetical scenario, I can imagine that would be really hard. <laughs> <laughs> like that's just the best way to ask. This is why when you're around older, wiser followers of Jesus who are at least 50, normally 50s, 60s and up, the main thing they talk about in life is acceptance. It's the main thing they talk about how to be happy in spite of the circumstances of your life, not because of it. And this last level, really, really deep in the soul, is where we are most in slavery, and the freedom of Jesus has the most to offer us. The Catholic theologian and psychologist Benedict Rochelle sums up the spiritual journey, the whole thing, as a decline in anxiety and an increase in peace. And what he means by peace is not just you feel chill and relaxed, but a deep sense of trust in God. Not trust in God that everything will work out. You learn really soon in life that everything will not work out. Deeper trust. Trust that whatever happens to you, good or bad, you have God, and that cannot ever be taken away from you. Ever. You have God and you have your mind and your heart and what you say yes to in the circumstances of your life. Nobody can ever take that from you. And once you come to a deep sense, as cliche as it is, where God is your happiness, at that point you are most free, not just to live happy, you are most free to love. Because as long as we're run by our anxiety, we have to manipulate people and circumstances to protect the life that we want, which is always holding us back from love. And so the more that we no longer need, the more that we take our hands off of our life, the more free we are to love. But that's two sermons coming later. I'm getting ahead of myself. This leads to the second stage, illumination. In illumination, we become what the mystics called proficient meaning we're proficient at following Jesus. We're proficient at the way of Jesus. We begin to experience transformation. Year over year, our inner disposition looks less and less like the list from Galatians 5 that I read, and more and more like the list in the next paragraph of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, say it with me, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, 
faithfulness and self-control. More and more, that becomes to name our reality. Our inner motivation begins, and it's slow, but to shift from the pleasure principle where we operate out of what makes me feel good to love. We begin to experience God's witness in prayer. When we pray, it's not just like, oh, there's a God up there. It's no, there's a God who is with me right here. And it's called illumination because a lot of it has to do with our mind. We come to believe not only things about Jesus, such as his death, burial, and resurrection next week, but we come to actually believe what Jesus himself believed about reality, about the good life, about the human condition, about the meaning of life, about love, about happiness. As we read scripture, as we sit under teaching, as we podcast or read books in our day, as we live in community and hear each other and ping off of each other and shape each other, we begin, and it takes years, but we begin to take on Jesus' mental maps of reality what Paul calls the mind of Christ. And again, in Paul's language, we are, quote, transformed by the renewing of our mind. Meaning as illumination, as reality comes into our mind, we are radically changed from the inside out, not just in our behavior, but in our core subconscious view and trust in what the world is. And a deep peace and joy comes over our mind and our body as we are all integrated into harmony with God's will. What the writers of the Bible call obedience. Obedience is a dirty word in our hyper-individualistic, egalitarian, at times to a fault, city. To us, it smacks of conformity or dronish behavior. It's anything but. I love this from Ortberg. Obedience to Jesus in all things is the journey. Like if you want to sum up the whole journey of Jesus in one sentence or one word, it's obedience. But then he writes this. Obedience is a far more creative, proactive, grace-powered, intelligent way of life than is normally thought in our day. The obedience Jesus called for requires judgment, discernment, creativity, and initiative. It is about becoming an excellent person, not an excellent rule follower. In fact, an obsessive concern with following rules will hinder your development into becoming the kind of person who does what Jesus says. In purgation, we come to follow Jesus fully and intelligently and creatively. But as time goes on, we realize this is not enough. To think well, to believe well, to live well, to pray, to do the stuff, it's not enough. We begin to ache at a soul level for the third and final stage, what the ancients called union. This is the highest level, and forgive me if that language makes you uncomfortable, but of psychological and spiritual maturity that we reach this side of resurrection. The mystics call people at this stage the perfect. From Jesus' line in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. People that actually get there. That word um, throws a lot of us off in the modern world. In English, we translate it perfect. Um, It's not a a better language. It has to do with this Greek word of telos or teleology or the end goal. Really, a better translation into English is mature. It does not mean that people at this stage are sinless. But for people at this stage, sin becomes the exception rather than the rule. And if you don't think that's possible, get out more and meet people that are old. You're like, I live in Portland. I don't know any of them. (laughs) Um, Meet 80-somethings who have been following Jesus twice as long as you've been alive and then come back to me and tell you, yeah, that's not possible. The language of union is all based on Jesus' teachings. In John 15 to 17, what scholars call the upper room discourse, which is Jesus' teachings to his apprentices on the last night before his death. It's all one kind of sermon around a dinner table, so to speak. In John 15, at the beginning, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me. And then at the end, he says in 17, I in them, he's praying to God, the Father, I in them and you, the Father in me, that they, it's us, lots of pronouns here, sorry, that they may be brought to complete unity. This is where we get the language of union, not only with each other, but with Jesus and with the Father, that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. We forget that all unity we have with each other is based on unity that we have with God. It's the triangle thing. As you move closer to God in union, you move closer to one another in union and vice versa. Before union, we abide in Jesus' language. 
or I think about that's from the, the noun, the cognate there is abode or home. We, to abide is to make your home in. Before union, we abide, we make our home in all sorts of other places than Jesus and his life. We abide in lust. We abide in anger. We abide in unforgiveness. We abide in hustle. We abide in comparison and discontentment and dissatisfaction and workaholism. In union, we come to abide in God, to make our home in God. Jesus said, my word abides in you. What is a word? A word is a carrier for an idea. What is a mind? The ceaseless flow of ideas back and forth. To abide in God and have his word abide in you is way more than to read the Bible a lot and memorize scripture. That's the beginning point. It is to live where your default setting, your home that you just come back to in every moment of peace is to live in a ceaseless flow of thoughts and feelings and desires that come from God and go back to God all through the day. At this point, we begin to experience not just God's out there in prayer, that's kind of stage one, purgation, not just God's witness in prayer, that's illumination, but God's inness in prayer, union, where we begin to realize that we are the temple of the Spirit. Before we knew that theologically, we read that in the New Testament. Now we know it practically. This is not indigenous pantheism. It's not Hindu mythology. It's not Buddhism. God is still God, and we are still us. The analogy used in Buddhist teaching, uh, for which I have much appreciation for, uh, most Buddhist teaching is really just ancient psychology. I have much appreciation for a lot of it. But the analogy is, you know, you're like a glass of water. We hear this all the time in our city. And you're, you know, you're poured out into the ocean. The problem with that analogy is glasses of water don't have names and faces. They don't have Enneagram numbers. Like, ooh, that water is such a type seven. It's just like a little fizzy, you know, whatever. <laughs> Doesn't have that. They don't have free will, they don't have volition, they don't have sadness and grief and trauma and anger and wish and fear. Humans have all of that, we have consciousness, all of that and more. In union in the Jesus tradition, we don't become less ourselves in unconsciousness, or in Buddhist language, the negation of thought. We become more ourselves in expanded consciousness. We lose our life in Jesus language in order to find our life. What we mean by union, or even by oneness, is intimacy. In the New Testament, Paul has this crazy passage that we read recently on marriage in Ephesians 5, where he writes that when marriage is like the pinnacle, when it's the best, and it's hard for us to imagine our cynical day and the breakdown of the family and divorce, but we can imagine in our mind's eye the best marriage possible, that level of intimacy where a man and a woman in sex are literally at a level of communion where they are inside of each other and overlap, that when it's healthy, when it's beautiful, when it's strong, is the closest closest word picture we have in our reality to the union that is, in Paul's language, Christ and the church. In fact, many ancients call this last level spiritual marriage. And as we near the end of our time, if you hear nothing else from me today, just hear one very simple thing. This is the end goal of our apprenticeship to Jesus. Presence and love. However you want to say that. Call that union, some writers call it a life of love. Every single stage theory paradigm there has ever been all agrees the end is, however you want to, whatever language you want to put around it, to, to abide in God and to incarnate his love to the world. That's the end goal. It's so key that we get that because where you're heading will shape every step that you take. Am I right? We need to remember that, you know, we're a charismatic church, but the end goal of the journey is not to prophesy and heal the sick and speak in tongues, not to raise the dead. That's all means. The end is to live in God's presence and to love. Those are just signs of love and presence and connection to God. We're a contemplative church, but the end goal isn't to live by a rule of life and slow down and practice Sabbath and do the fixed hour prayer and do the exam at night and really like discipline. That's beautiful, but that's not the goal. The goal is, that's all means. The end is presence and love. We're a biblical church, but the end isn't to know the Bible. The Bible is a beautiful thing, but it is a means to an end. 
the end is to, as Paul writes in the New Testament, quote, live in love. We could go on. We, we are a kingdom-minded church, but the end isn't to start redemptive businesses in the city or run alpha for thousands of people or do justice or revolutionize the foster care system where there's a waiting list of you know, parents for children. All of that's means. The end is to become people who abide, who make our home in the presence of God in us, not just around us, not just with us, but in us, and to live in his love for every person we come into contact with. And if that sounds like a pipe dream to you, and I get it, I have the cynic in my brain too, don't let him define your reality or her, just to be gender neutral. We've all had glimpses of this kind of a life. We've all had moments that were an advance sign of what is coming or what has the potential to come for you with Jesus. A moment where you were just so caught up in the goodness of music or a concert or a meal with your friends or play or sex or a hike in nature or even work that you lost all sense of time, you lost all concern for yourself and you just got swallowed up in the love and the joy and the peace of the now. It's union. A moment where you're just, you were acutely aware from outside of yourself I am not alone. A moment where everything was falling to pieces and yet still you just had this deep sense of peace that it's not okay, but I'm okay. A moment where you were just somehow, when it really mattered, when push came to shove, you were your best self and just love and service, it just, it came easily out of your inner nature. These are glimpses of your future. If, key word there, if, you continue to apprentice under Jesus, the rabbi and far more than a rabbi, who doesn't have opinions, who has reality. If you apprentice under him, if you stay on the journey, these are just glimpses of the kind of life that is possible, not just in a fleeting one-off, like visit this experience, but as an abode, as a home, as a new normal. So, awakening, purgation, illumination, union. Was that helpful at all? Just don't say no, just email, you'll email me later, I know you will. Um, If not, come back next week and just something about live in love. Yes, if that's all you get today, live in love. Now, our practice for the week ahead is all up at practicingtheway.org backslash naming. We have two very simple exercises for you this week just to kind of get you started. And there's not a spiritual discipline, so these ones are a little bit easier to do. All you S's on the Myers-Briggs, just relax, it's okay. Um, The first is just to sit with your community after your weekly meal and work through a few very simple questions. uh, What stage seems to best describe where you're at right now? What's your season of life? What level of purgation best represents your current fight with sin? Is there anywhere where you feel stuck? And so on. And then there's a second exercise. And again, all of this is optional. If you're too busy or whatever, you don't have to do it this week and the weeks to come. But the second is to get one-on-one with somebody in your community or a close friend and just talk through your spiritual autobiography. Not your autobiography, your spiritual autobiography. To force yourself to view your life from 30,000 feet. If God was the good shepherd and you were the sheep and you were writing your story as if God was out in front of you, how would you tell your story so far? To force yourself to think that way, to get clarity, because often hindsight is twenty twenty, and you'll look back and you realize, oh my gosh, that was God, that was God, that was God, that was providential, that was the hand of God. Oh, and you'll begin to realize somebody else is leading your life. And that will set you free. To end, one closing thought. Um, the goal, and I need to especially say this for those of you that are wired remotely like me, in which case, I'm sorry, hopefully you have a good therapist. But... The goal is not to get to the next stage. It's just to take the next step. It's just to move forward. It's not to arrive. You never arrive. It's just to move forward. Every stage is good. Every season of life, even the hard ones, hold out both pain and possibility, joy and sadness, 
things that are easy about that stage and things that are really hard. Temptations from the world, the flesh, and the devil in that recent language. And invitations from Jesus, the good shepherd. The question that I just wanna invite you to sit in over the next few weeks and months is very simple. And I will literally say this to you every single week and I'll give you more theology behind this question in a month, but it's a very simple question. What are the invitations of Jesus to me in this stage of my apprenticeship? What are his overtures toward me? Put another way, what is Jesus doing, or better language is trying to do in my life, because often we do not cooperate with him. What is Jesus trying to do in my life right now, and how do I just say yes? How do I say yes? And just take, put another way, what's the next step? What's the next step forward into presence and love?